in the right place. This is the Eat Fluencer Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Maggie Landis. Together, we are going to unpack everything about eating and discover the what, when, and how that will let you lead your best life. This is not your doctor's conversation about nutrition. Today is when you can start to love eating again. Let food be food and you be you. Get ready to get eat fluenced. Welcome back to the Eat Fluencer podcast. I'm Maggie Landis and I'm your host here. I'm glad you're joining me today. This is episode number 52 a snack-sized episode about snacking. And um, I just want to remind you, if you enjoy the Eat Fluencer podcast and are getting value out of the content here, please leave a rating or a review. If you're so kind to just take a moment and do that, I'd really appreciate that. It helps with visibility and gets this message, this mission uh, of the anti-diet culture into the ears of the right people. So I greatly appreciate that. And today, we're going to have a little snack size podcast. Um, there's only so much to say about this, but it is a topic that I am asked about frequently because the idea of snacking and is snacking good or is snacking bad or am I supposed to eat six times a day or three times a day or one time a day, this is like all a very prominent controversial narrative in diet culture and nutrition. So I wanted to just kind of talk about snacking, uh, give you some facts and let you make your own decision at the end of this. But we're going to get into this first by talking about really what is a snack. And here's the reason this gets complicated is because you know, we've already talked about all the reasons that nutrition science in general is complicated to start with because there's so many confounding variables. There's so many factors out of your control. There's um, a lot of challenge in uh, having people recall their food intake, which is usually how these studies are conducted. Uh, you're looking for outcomes, uh, particularly if you're talking about you know, cardiovascular disease or diabetes or something, you're looking for things that are going to happen like way, way, way off in the distance. So it's, it's a super challenging scientific discipline, but that becomes even more challenging when you start talking about snacks, because what does that mean? Well, for, um, some people, a snack has to do with the type of food that you're eating. And there's this idea of snack foods that are different. They are different foods. They are different categories of foods. They are packaged differently. Um, and they're sort of set apart from foods that you would eat at a typical meal. There is some people that define snack based on the amount of food that's consumed. And that, uh, you know, in the in the literature, you can see all sorts of random caloric numbers, like 200 calories, 300 calories, whatever, is it like a, some sort of limit that is the border between snack and meal? Um, I, you know, I think calories are sort of silly in the first place, but you know, some people think you can eat anything for a snack, but as long as it's not a lot of it, um, there's other people that believe snacking has more to do with how you consume the food. And, you know, if you're sitting at a table eating, then that's a meal, and perhaps you could even eat a small amount of something and it would just be a small meal compared to if you're eating in the workplace or you're eating while you're standing or you're eating while you're driving, then those would be snacks. Um, and then there's, you know, this is a, a very gray area where there's uh, lots of definitions. Um, and this also is a cultural um, thing too, that there are, you know, cultures where eating smaller meals is still considered a meal. Whereas maybe in the U S here, we would consider that a snack just based on the amount of food that's being eaten. But you know, why do we even care who like, this seems like a lot of semantics and nuance that's trivial, but what's really interesting. One of, you know, one of the things 
that's interesting, the most, probably the most interesting thing that I'm going to tell you here is that defining and labeling something as a snack versus a meal influences how much you eat, the type of food you eat, the quality of food you eat. Okay. And we get all that. And whether or not you report satiety and fullness at the end, even if it's the same. So they've like, this is, you know, I mean, this isn't hard science. This is sort of soft science, but basically there's these studies where they gave people a set amount of food and they told them like, here, we want you to eat this meal. And then at the end of it, you know, they had all these like sort of quiz questions about whether they were full, whether they were satisfied, whether they enjoyed it, whether they were still hungry, what, you know, if they predicted when they would want to eat again, all this kind of stuff. And then they gave the exact same thing. I mean, the exact same food, the exact same amount to different people and they labeled it as a snack. And there was a significant difference in how they perceived their satiety and fullness and those sorts of things when it was actually literally the same exact thing. So it does kind of matter how we label our eating because it um, changes how we react to it. Uh, And that just, I think, speaks to the fact that we generally are making eating such an intellectual exercise that we've pulled ourselves away from our body's signaling and this whole concept of intuitive eating that your body knows what it needs and when it needs it and is trying to communicate with us. And I promise you your body, like your organs and your cells, don't care if you're labeling it as a snack or a meal. And if you're listening to the sort of biofeedback from your body, it won't matter whether you've labeled it as a snack or a meal. But because we are trying to constantly play into this diet culture idea of like outsmarting our biology and and thinking ourselves into health and and a lot of, you know, decision making is happening all the time. It's sort of uh, that's that was a fascinating thing for me to see in the literature that it actually um, is kind of true. The other thing is, uh, like I said, there's a lot of that. This is a big business. All right. This is a really big business, but this is a global business. This is, um, of course, the United States is like one of the top rated snack consumers. No shocker there, but, um, lots of other countries are, are deriving a good amount of their food intake from what they culturally label as snacks. Um, in fact, you know, in the U S and most of, um, Europe, it's, uh, estimated, you know, like I said, this is still tough to sort of tease out, but that Americans and these, um, particularly Western European countries, people are deriving about a quarter of their daily energy from eating outside of meals or what they're defining as meals. Um, fascinating to me. And the global snack food industry is what I saw here quoted as a $630 billion industry. So, uh, I, this is no news to you, but there are a lot of manufacturers, producers, retailers, people involved in this whole aspect of uh, snack food and uh, the snack food industry that are going to uh, advocate for you snacking. Let's just put it that way. They have a lot of skin in the game. This is a big business and they would highly benefit from you as an individual believing that you need their products. I mean, that's just how business works. Now, of course, if they just pitch it to you like a big sales pitch, then you feel like it's one just big commercial. But um, there is this narrative in diet culture, and some of you have probably heard this, that uh, snacking and eating these smaller frequent meals or whatever you want to call it, you know, quote, uh, fires up your metabolism and uh, helps you 
uh, use the food energy and causes you to maintain your weight or lose weight or all these sorts of things. And as far as the research I've investigated in and many people that have sort of compiled the research together, there's no data to show that, you know, snack to snack to snack, um, there's any difference in the thermic effect or the metabolic rate or any of this fancy pants kind of physiology stuff um, related to the eating. And, you know, they're, they they did do some studies where they had, this is crazy, they had the two groups. They had the people that had no snacks and three meals a day or, get this, the other, the snacking, you know, uh, intervention group had 17 smaller snack meals a day. Okay, come on. So nobody's going to do that for real. Um, But even, I mean, even that study didn't really pan out beyond two weeks of time. So, you know, this, this is an area that needs more research is what it says. But, you know, I don't know that it really needs more research because does it really matter? Um, You know, let's just, let's go through here some of the advantages or disadvantages of having a snack routine. All right. Um, One benefit is that if you are snacking in response to hunger, then that's probably a good thing. That is intuitive eating. That is your body telling you that it is not sufficiently fueled to continue without some energy intake and responding to that with eating a snack slash small meal will um, help you function and prevent you also from becoming so ravenously hungry when you ignore your initial hunger cueing that when the next meal time comes you are sort of out of control binge eating. So that's a benefit of snacking if you're responding to hunger. Um, It does allow another opportunity. Snacking allows another opportunity to get some extra nutrients um, if they are being missed at the kind of main meal times. Um, This is you know, particularly maybe helpful for people recovering from eating disorders, um, for uh, young children, you know, toddlers who are not eating a large volume or a large variety of food at mealtime. Um, even elderly people, really, there is some evidence that it benefits elderly people to, um, you know, fulfill their complement of nutrient needs by eating snacks because they tend to not eat large meals uh, as large of meals at one time. But that of course is only going to kind of pan out if the snacks you're choosing are filling that gap in the, the nutrition requirement. Now, you know, there's also some benefit of just convenience and that, um, while, you know, it's not recommended, you know, in terms of mindful eating to be eating while distracted, eating while working, eating while driving, all these things. But, you know, the truth of the matter is we have busy on the go type lifestyles and we may need foods that are quick, um, easy to eat, you know, sort of available in these situations when uh, mealtime may not be regular or necessarily timely or scheduled the way that we ideally might want to do it. Now, the disadvantage of snacking is that this culture of snacking and the snack food industry has capitalized on these maybe potential benefits and used that to market their products, which uh, sometimes, uh, oftentimes, are less uh, nutrient-dense. So, you know, 
yes, if you're not getting enough vitamin C, then eating citrus fruit for a snack is a good idea. But let's be honest, are we mostly eating citrus fruit for snacks or are we eating cookies and chips and crackers, which is fine. And you know me, I don't like categorizing food as good or bad. And there is no good or bad. And chips are fine. Chips are equal to citrus fruit in terms of desirability and and meaning. But if the excuse of snacking is that it's meeting a nutritional need, then we need to like be honest with whether we're actually making selections that are meeting that nutritional need. Um, you know, and the disadvantage is that this like secondary distracted eating when we tend to be consuming snacks. I mean, very few people I know, honestly, sit down at a table with a plate and a napkin and a fork to eat a quote snack. I mean, most people, including myself, when we're snacking, we're doing something else. And that um, can result in this disconnection from our satiety signaling and this kind of mindless consumption where we're not even really tasting the food. We're not really enjoying the food. It's kind of like impulsive and um, we're not in touch with whether we are continuing to be hungry or whether we're, you know, full or satisfied. Um, so that's a, that's a big challenge. But uh, the other thing, you know, sort of the physiologic thing about eating all the time is insulin is a very important hormone. And there's a lot of reasons. Insulin is the signal to the body that I have energy that needs to be stored. That's basically what it means. So when you eat anything and your serum glucose goes up, insulin goes up. And insulin tells your body, put sugar glucose into the cells so that our body organs can function. And if there's leftover energy, store it in fat deposits. That's the messaging that insulin is giving. Um, and of course, then that as the um, serum glucose kind of drops after that postprandial spike, then the insulin starts declining and that sort of thing. The body is designed to have intermittent feeding. Okay. So the body is designed to have periods where there's high levels of energy available and it's either put into use, put into storage. And then there's a period where we're relying on that energy in between the intake. Okay. And we know clinically people that are getting continuous feedings, okay? So somebody that's like on a tube feeding that's running continuously 24 hours a day, they can have a lot of challenges with their metabolism and their hormones and their pancreatic enzymes and their liver and stuff. It's not, like the body's optimal design is not continuous feeding. Okay, now I understand eating two or three snacks a day is not the same as somebody getting 24-7 you know, G tube feedings or something, but, um, it, there's a spectrum, right? And there is, uh, some, I guess, dysregulation maybe is the right word of the appetite hormones and, uh, ghrelin and, and leptin and all those things that might be thrown off by frequent eating because it's basically like this little, if you imagine like a ball bouncing, it's, like the insulin starts going down and then as soon as it's like at that postprandial level or even before it gets there, you eat again and it goes back up and then it never has a chance to like totally, uh, you know, temporarily resolve. And, you know, is that harmful over the long term? Mm, that jury's still out on that too. I mean, there is some discussion about whether that leads to insulin resistance and adverse glucose profiles and increase in serum lipids and things like that. But, um, it's just a challenging thing to study anything related to food and eating and long-term outcomes is next to impossible. So what is 
the summary. Well, here's my take on this. We're spending a heck of a lot of our bandwidth trying to <laughs> label all this and and overthink this and name certain foods meals and certain food snacks and certain amounts meals and snacks and certain times of days meals and snacks and again like I said earlier an example of us trying to micromanage and intellectualize I think that's a word I just made it up uh, intellectualize our our nutrition into this real cerebral math problem but the truth is it doesn't make sense to make a universal recommendation or a one size fits all judgment that you should eat three times a day. You should eat six times a day. You should eat two times a day, whatever. Um, because there are so many variables, your, your own, even for one individual person, their daily, you know, energy and nutrient needs vary greatly. And there's also lots and lots of psychological, cultural, socioeconomic factors that play into this. And it would be, you know, ignorant to just make a recommendation. So I am in the camp of not overthinking this. And if we stop being so boxed in about, I can only eat meals with no snacks, or I should only eat six small meal snacks a a day or I'm only allowed one snack or whatever if we could just stop counting everything and measuring everything and looking at the clock and scrutinizing the food agenda so hard and stop trying to jockey our metabolism and try to quote outwit ourselves you know, the bottom line is the body works. The human body is so much smarter than me or you or any of these researchers or authors of these papers or scientists. The body has a million very advanced ways to regulate all these things and communicate with you and let you know what it needs and when it needs it. So I think that the most likely thing is we are overthinking this way too much and spending way too much um, attention trying to study this and make universal recommendations. And it's a big distraction from learning about our body and learning about food and intuitive eating, which is how humans were built to eat. So here's my recommendation to you. Honor your hunger and if you are hungry you can eat. You need unconditional permission to eat and know that your body needs that uh, level of trust that it will be fed when it gives you notice that it needs food. It is preferable to avoid distracted eating, all right? Like the mindless distracted eating when you're not paying attention, you're not enjoying it, you don't know how much you've had, you don't even really care, there's no pleasure, there's no, you know, just that sort of, if it's possible to avoid that or minimize that, that would be great. To eat with intention, whether that is, however you're going to categorize it, whether that's a meal or a snack or a small meal or a big snack or what, it doesn't even matter, but just... Every time you make a decision to eat, that it is done with a level of intentionality. And then uh, stop when you're full and satisfied and know that, that food is available in the future. And that comes with doing this over time, this level of body trust and uh, trust in yourself that you do have unconditional permission to eat. And as we've always talked about, labeling things good and bad and snack food and meal food and healthy food and junk food and empty calories and this and da 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 never benefits anybody learning to do this. So if you can try to maintain your neutrality about food and just kind of let food be food, uh, that will help. And, you know, eat the most diverse array of foods that you can, that you enjoy, 
that you have access to, that you can afford, that fit into your lifestyle. Just try to diversify to the best of your ability. And that's it. Really, full stop. Just uh, not overthinking this whole snack issue is probably our best ticket out. So... That's a little a little information about snacking. Um, whether I've answered your question or not, how many times a day should I eat? You know, there's not one answer. And I hope that this has at least given you some background so you can decide. But, you know, the short story is there's not an answer. And there's not an answer for you even as one individual person because from day to day, your needs, your desire, your access, everything is going to change. So... Just listen to your body. It works. And try to, you know, be open-minded about um, letting letting yourself accept what your body is doing and trying to tell you. All right. Well, I appreciate you being here today for this conversation. Again, a reminder to leave a rating or review for the podcast if you are interested. There's a new episode every Wednesday of the Eat Fluencer podcast. And I'm so glad you joined us today. Until next time. Thank you so much for being here today. If you love what you've learned, follow me on social media at Maggie Landis MD and you'll never miss a thing. You can also check out my website at MaggieLandisMD.com and sign up to be part of our community of eaters. Thanks again for stopping by. We'll talk again soon.